to today's colloquium. It's a great honor for us to uh, have Mark Bergman here as, a, as our colloquium speaker and guest today. Um, many of you know him uh, presumably, and um, uh, nevertheless I'll uh, give a short introduction. So, uh, I did his um, PhD in uh, 1981. Uh, that, that was at the Royal Institute of Technology in, in Stockholm. Uh, on the thesis of uh, aspects from states in atom physics. And uh, then uh, stayed mostly in, in Stockholm, but also in, 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 in uh, Uppsala from 1995 to 1996, and then uh, went back to Stockholm as a professor of theoretic physics. Uh, he has received many awards. So he has been elected member of the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He recently uh, got a uh, prestigious award for the funding of the Oscar Klein Center for Cosmoparticle Physics in, in Stockholm. He's been uh, awarded the medal for, from the King of Sweden for significant contributions to Swedish research, including his work on uh, as the Secretary of the Nobel Committee for Physics of the Academy of Sciences. So, if any of you feels that you uh, deserve the Nobel Prize, you can have some uh, call um, And so, without further ado, um, I would say let's uh, welcome Lars to Heidelberg and then let's listen to the talk. So, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to take you in this honorable. Uh, hall, but uh, it will be nice to meet. And, uh, hopefully, you will learn a few things. Uh, so, this is actually the, the picture of the Abanova Center, as it is called, where the Oscar Heinz Center is located. So, I have been the director and, and I started that center six years ago. Now, I will actually step down. I will go to the faculty as a, a dean of the mathematical. Sciences. So therefore, the university has decided that my position will be open uh, for applications. So maybe you yourself, or if you know someone that could be interested in coming to a permanent professorship in Sweden, you could take the opportunity to at least look at the advertisements, which is on the www.su.se. The science, so Professor of Cosmopolitan Physics. So please look at that and maybe we will see one of you there as a new director of Cosmic Science. So, uh, well, as you saw, there is a question mark in the title Has dark matter been detected? And uh, you can find in the, in the news uh, papers and in, in the scientific journals now and then uh, headlines that claim that. You know, there have been traces found of, of elusive dark matter. So that is basically what this talk will be about. And in some sense, we have, of course, already detected dark matter because we are seeing it as gravitational interaction. So the first part of this talk, I will just go through uh, all the clues that have really brought us to this conclusion that yes, indeed, there is a lot of dark matter there. It has been detected through its gravitational interaction, but it should have other interactions also, for many reasons. And the one reason I will go through in some detail is what's called the wind mirror. So I will show a mirror. Uh, I will also discuss the methods that we have, three different methods essentially, to find out about the identity of the dark matter and go through some of these indications that there are for detection already of dark matter. I will discuss it critically and I will give some future prospects. Okay, <clears throat> so the first gravitational observations of dark matter, as far as we know, and uh, what uh, we find if we search the literature, is what Fritz Zwicky noticed many years ago, in 1933, he actually uh, published a paper 
where he presented his analysis of the coma cluster, which is a cluster of galaxies. Uh, I think I will have a point here as well. Uh, so, and he used something that's called the Virgil theory, that many of you probably know about, that he, he could just look at the relative uh, velocities of the galaxies in this cluster, and they move so fast with respect to one another that they shouldn't really be bound. You know, the velocities look to be higher than the escape velocity from the cluster, but still they were bound and, you know, in a very relaxed uh, and almost uh, uh, equilibrium sense. So therefore he said that uh, there had to be an overdensity of matter in the cluster to keep all the luminous galaxies there, to hold them in place. And he said that if this over-density is confirmed, we would arrive at the astonishing conclusion that dark matter is present with a much greater density than luminous matter. So these were really prophetic words. I mean, it's more than 80 years ago, and it uh, really shows the uh, ingenuity of, of Fritz Zwicky. And as you may know, he discovered many other things. He was really one of the great founders of uh, physical cosmology. Then uh, Babcock, he measured the optical rotation curve of the Andromeda galaxy and noticed, so here are his data, he noticed that the rotation curve doesn't fall off as it should. So, so this is where uh, using Newtonian mechanics you would expect that after the extent of the luminous part of the galaxy the rotation curve should fall off because it's driven by the enclosed mass. And since the, in the, if there would only be visible matter, there is nothing outside this optical thing that's visible here, it should really fall off rapidly. But it doesn't. He showed that he, instead it continues to rise. And that was already in 1939. Uh, in those days, one never gave uh, uh, errors on the measuring uh, points. And, and probably there should be rather big errors here. But anyway, the tendency was quite clear. The, the galaxy rotates again too fast in the outer parts. And he even said that uh, uh, the, the difference, I mean, he came to a conclusion that there was much more mass than, than stars in, in the system. And he said that this difference can be <coughs> attributed mainly to the very great mass. Uh, on, calculated on the basis of the unexpectedly large circular velocities of these parts. So he, again, somebody with the right intuition realized that he could use his behavior to infer that there was sort of hidden mass in this uh, Andromeda uh, galaxy. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, of course, as time has gone on, one has noticed in many, many systems, essentially all galaxies, that uh, the rotation curve has a similar behavior. Of course, one could think that maybe there's something wrong with the, you know, Newtonian gravity or Einstein's gravity. So, and that's why the, the rotation curve doesn't follow this sort of Keplerian uh, behavior that one would suspect if, if it just was luminous matter. And in particular, there was a theory, a theory called Mond <coughs> that could be fitted to rotation curve, to flat rotation curves. But it turns out that if you go to the next uh, length scale in, in cosmology, namely uh, galaxy clusters, this uh, proposal doesn't work at all. And in particular, the so-called bullet cluster, which is a, a pair of colliding clusters where one can reconstruct the mass through weak gravitational lensing. It's a very clever method. Really, uh, pioneered or invented by, by Einstein. Uh, and one sees that the total mass is located sort of outside the visible mass, because this is the equivariance, the visible mass. And these clusters are completely dominated by the, the, the uh, X ray emitting gas. And it's uh, clear from this picture that the dark matter that gives the bulk of the, the, the mass is different from the luminous. Uh, matter, because they are not centered in the same place. And one sees that the luminous matter has gone through, you know, shocks and all kinds of things you expect from, 
or variables where the dark matters we can go through each other you know, unaffected more or So that basically kills the model model unless you introduce dark matter in this model, which is kind of weird because you have you know invented one just to get rid of the need for dark matter. And of course, on the uh, even larger scales, we know now that uh, Einstein gravity works extremely well, and it, it has become a standard model of cosmology, one they call it, which is the so-called lambda CDM model. So what's that? Well, the lambda is the cosmological constant of Einstein, and CDM means cold dark matter. So. It's clear from this data that you absolutely need dark matter to, for instance, uh, explain this uh, acoustic peaks that's found. So if you take the angular Fourier transform of this map, uh, this is essentially the same you know, data as that one, just in a form that's uh, more convenient for us physicists to, to, to deal with. And you see that there are uh, various peaks and troughs that have to do with you know the, the basic uh, oscillatory motion at the time of emission of the cosmic microwave background. And the, the curve you see here is a lambda CDM model with parameters uh, given by the per almost perfect fit to, to the data points. Uh, <coughs> and here you see in, in another way the CMB results uh, that on their own cannot tell exactly what the omega matter, which is the matter density in terms of the so-called critical density and the uh, density in lambda. But you see if you combine supernova results with something called barium acoustic oscillations, which are basically these peaks that uh, you know, move forward in time, and then the CP, there's a, a unique solution that tells you that omega matter is something like you know, 27 or so percent, and uh, then omega lambda is, you know, 70 percent, something like that, and actually barriers is a small fraction, it's 5 percent only of the total energy content of the universe. So this is a, a very strange, but also a, 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 an extremely uh, successful model, this simple lambda CDM model, with something that moves non-relativistically when structure forms, that's what cold means here, and with a simple cosmological constant, so it's something that doesn't vary with time nor with space. And all data, all cosmological data at the present time, as far as I know, really agrees with this simple uh, lambda CDM model. So here are just a couple of examples that uh, actually with the uh, results from Walter Springer here in Heidelberg. Uh, and so here are the simulations compared to real data. And if you didn't know what was simulation and what was real data, there's no way you could tell because statistically these are really similar, extremely similar distributions. Uh, this was already in 2006. The, the, this picture shows the current status of the extremely impressive numerical simulations, including hydrodynamics and so on, that Walter uh, Springer and his colleagues are doing at the present time. So here is not only dark matter, here is also the variables, and you see all kinds of interesting uh, structures. Uh, this is only dark, dark matter. But anyway, the picture is quite clear that we definitely need dark matter. And just a year ago or so came uh, this further strong evidence for the existence of dark matter. And this is a detection that nominal at least is 25 standard deviations. So you can you see that this lambda CDM fits perfectly with the distribution of gravitational lensing of intervening structures. If you look if you have the microwave background as a source, you can look at the so, Shear set that uh, is caused by the intervening structure. So, on the large scales, it seems unavoidable to introduce dark matter. So, what about the small scales? 
Well, there, there are some sort of puzzles. But it turns out that all of these small scale problems or puzzles, they only appear when variants are really a dominant component. So, for instance, in the inner part of galaxies, we know in, in the Milky Way, for instance, that since the barriers can lose angular momentum, they will accumulate near the center. So near the galactic center, there's a lot of uh, baryonic matter. And so for instance, the so-called cusp core problem has to do with that. So uh, you get from these embodied simulations a prediction for the density profile. But if you measure that, the density profiles of many galaxies, it seems that uh, you don't really get what's predicted by this dark matter only and body simulations. Uh, but this is from a talk by Alison Brooks, uh, who gave a talk in Amsterdam and June, and she explained all of these uh, so-called problems, or, or what a crisis, uh, quotation mark, of cold dark matter. And she showed that much of this can actually be solved by the feedback on the dark matter distribution of barriers. So it's, and that's actually how the field is evolving now, that these embodied simulations that used to have only dark matter particles, they now also have all the complicated uh, you know, barriers and, and the supernova explosions and all kinds of physical processes like that. And it turns out that they do change really the predictions of the dark matter only simulations. Uh, <coughs> so one had so sort of invented other models, something called warm dark matter models, which is, you know, so warm is, is not cold, but it's, and it's not hot, so this is kind of a fine-tuning solution that could solve a couple of these problems, but not all. And also self-interacting dark matter could solve a couple. Well, of course, it might still be that, you know, dark matter is self-interacted, but the motivation really of solving these problems is not really there. And, uh, but actually, as uh, Christian Bronner, who is here, has shown with Dr. Riemann and our Anna uh, if one does introduce a, a new interaction, one gets actually a very economical way to, to, to solve some of these problems. So, so one has to keep an open mind. Since we don't know what the dark matter is, we don't really know how it interacts. That's another way to put it. Here is something that shows what, at least I think, that the dark matter uh, is. Because it, this is this famous wind miracle. And this connects cosmology then with particle physics. Because we think that this cold dark matter has to be made up out of particles. I mean, that's you know, the basic constituents that we have of all, all matter. And it's kind of amazing that if you <coughs> use basic thermodynamics, so relativistic equilibrium thermodynamics in the early universe, where the uh, reactions were extremely rapid so that equilibrium could be maintained, uh, you find that you know, at early times, so here times goes from left to right, so at early times, when temperatures were enormously high, one could pair produce these particles, the dark matter particles, and but again, when they had been produced, they could annihilate, and there was sort of an equilibrium. So it followed the equilibrium curve that's very well specified by thermodynamics. But at some point, if these particles are weakly interacting, they, and of course, when the universe expanded, there were too few of these particles per volume unit to make the reaction go the other way. So they were produced that if they had a long lifetime, and now we're speaking about you know, the lifetime of the universe at, at that moment, that since we still see this effect of dark matter, we have to have particles with an extremely long time, lifetime, probably even stable particles. But <coughs> this uh, dilution effect means that the dark matter density freezes out, as one calls it, at a certain temperature. And the remarkable thing here is that the weaker the interaction, the earlier the distribution is leaving this uh, equilibrium distribution. So if one has a strong interaction, then the particle reactions go on and go on for a very long time, and then you see that this co-moving number density 
So here one has uh, compensated the expansion of the universe. The commoving number density would go down and down and down. So actually the weakest the weakest weakest interactions in particles really would make those particles survive. And if they are stable, they should survive even to, to, to present case. And if one puts in numbers, one sees that for typical particle physics coupling, what's called gauge couplings, like you know, the electric charges and so on. Uh, and for a mass between let's say 50 to maybe a thousand or so TV, roughly, one gets a relic density here that exactly coincides with what with what we had in this other plot that we had on you know, this 25 percent or so dark matter. This might of course be a coincidence, who knows? But it's too much of a coincidence as many of us think. So that's why we call this the weak miracle. That if we have a particle of this mass and if it has sort of typical particle physics coupling, it's a perfect dark matter candidate. Of course, this is very generic, so we don't really know much about the dark matter particle anyway. It could be, for instance, a, a subsymmetric particle could also have something to do with the Oscar Klein Center because Kaluza Klein theories are theories with extra dimensions, and it turns out that also the lightest Kaluza Klein particle could be a, an excellent dark matter candidate. So, so these are particles that should have weak coupling, and the lightest one is protected by symmetry, but it, it is stable. So that's at somewhat high mass scales, maybe 600 to 1000 dB. One could also imagine that the heat sector is richer than the one particle that we have found. And, and for instance, there are theories called inert Higgs tablets, where one has a, a second Higgs tablet that doesn't interact directly with the, with the quark, but just indirectly through the other Higgs. And that also leaves one stable particle that is a very good. Candidate. One could also have a massive uh, right hand neutrino because we think that there are right hand neutrinos, because that's one very economic way to explain why neutrinos are so very light but still not massless. They have a mass with extremely tiny mass, and there is something called the seesaw mechanism that produces these right hand neutrinos, and these are uh, in, in many models are weak interacting and could be stable. So that's also very good to kind of Then, of course, maybe we are fooled by these wind particles, and of course, it could be other particles that uh, have uh, you know, the, the right uh, properties to give this relative density correctly. And just a couple of examples axions is something that <coughs> was introduced to explain the, the so called CP uh, problem in, in strong interactions. I could have sterile neutrinos, so not just the three neutrino types that we know exist, maybe there are other, exist, there are other uh, neutrinos that don't interact so strongly. It could be something called dark photons, and, you know, they are, and probably if one would list all possibilities, one would get an enormous number of proposals for the dark matter. And this is just an example by Tim Tate to, <coughs> to show the enormous breadth of uh, predictions. And of course, the only thing to take home from this picture, I think, is this basic question. So, so that's, that's the truth. We don't know if any of this is the correct explanation. So maybe there is some, you know, maybe it's something that we have overlooked, and maybe some other view comes, you know, the right theory of so, it. So, how do we search for these particles? Well, Hopefully, they, at least some of them do exist. And there are basically three methods. So, of course, discovery at accelerators, that would really be a, extremely, uh, an extremely powerful way to, to learn about a new sector of, of uh, particles. And we know that the ANC was extremely successful in finding the Higgs uh, particle. Uh, and after that, and dark matter search is one of the major LAC research areas. And if something is found, of course well, that would give a very important number, namely the mass of that particle. But it will be impossible, I would say, to show, of course, that it 
to live long enough to be a dark matter because you should live you know, more than the actual universe. And all particles that accelerate, they say, and in particular, one of these uh, weakly interacting particles would just uh, pass the detector and uh, would disappear and you wouldn't be able to ever see it again and see it, see it decaying. So therefore, probably one would need <coughs> one of these other methods also, and there are two other methods. So direct detection is a very simple idea that if these halos that seem to surround uh, galaxies, and according to all uh, current indications, there should be dark matter everywhere. So even in this room, it should be of the order of you know, one per, let's say, 10 meters or something like that moving with typical galactic velocity, so a couple of hundred kilometers per second. And that's a rather big flux if you compute it. But of course, cross-sections are very small, so in practice one needs large chunks of matter. So for instance, xenon or uranium or, or some other uh, suitable nucleus that one can control the background uh, radioactivity and so on. Uh, and we will see some examples of results. It's an experiment from Gamma, Simon Hanway, Black Seed, and NASA, so on. So, acronyms of various experiments. So, that's a very uh, interesting method uh, that is uh, making a lot of progress at the moment. But we'll come back to that. Then there's indirect detection, and there one looks at what happens when two of these particles meet in the galaxy. And the, the probability, it turns out, is always the highest in, near the center of the galaxy. So if two of these particles meet, actually this is sort of uh, the generic uh, symbol for a dark matter particle, this chi or x if you want. And in many of these models, in particular supersymmetric model, uh, since these are neutral particles, they can be their own antiparticles. And it actually turns out to be so. So two particles can meet and they annihilate into particles and antiparticles. And of course, also gamma rays, for instance. Uh, and these are the, the interesting particles to look for in the cosmic rays, because there are not so many other sources of antimatter. And by the way, that's one of the unexplained mysteries of the universe, if you want to find some other problem than the dark matter to think about deeply. And that is, why is there only matter and not antimatter in the universe. So as far as we have seen, and one can get very uh, strong constraints on antimatter from the microwave background, for instance, and there doesn't seem to be any big chunk of antimatter in, in all the visible universe. No why is that? We don't really know. This has to do with something called CP vibration, and uh, there are sort of hints <coughs> how this comes about, but nobody has really found the explanation. So that's something I need to discuss. The coffee or beer or whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, annihilation is interesting because it goes like the square of the number density. Because two particles have to be at the same place. So that's why it's square in density. So that means that if you have a region that has an enhancement of the number density, then you get a very uh, large annihilation rate. So in particular, the center of the galaxy, maybe also some external uh, galaxies, what we look at, and even galaxy clusters. So we will come back to that. But these are basically the methods that we have to search for dark matter. Uh, as I said, supersymmetry <laughs> was for a long time uh, a very good candidate, and I think it's, it's is still, and in particular, it's a very good template for a dark matter candidate. So, if you want to design a new experiment to search for dark matter, you should check first is it effective to find supersymmetric dark matter candidates. So, supersymmetry is a very good template for a new physics beyond the standard model. And this is just to show that, you know, uh, the so called phenomenological MSSM, minimal supersymmetric standard model has no problem at all to explain the uh, measured X mass under 25 dB. Uh, also, there are some hints that maybe something is lurking in the LEC data. And we will, of course, see if this, uh, this is 
one excess is, you know, it's not really significant. It's almost the same as not really. And, but if this is a, a sign of, of a subsymmetric neutralino, as it was, subsymmetric parameter, then the mass seems to be something like 150 GeV, which is right in this range of, you know, 50 GeV to 1000 GeV. That's so we see, this might turn out to be, you know, a, a new effect that survives the LSC when it starts again next year. So this would be quite exciting, actually. Uh, this is a very puzzling experiment. This is the so-called DAMA experiment. So this is now direct detection. And here, uh, the Drukier, Katie Fries, who actually just came to Stockholm to us, so she's at the Science uh, Center also. So she moved from Michigan actually to, to Sweden. She got a, a big grant from our research council, so that she has at least 10 years to stay with us. Uh, she realized that since the solar system moves around the galaxy, so it goes one turn in about 200 million years because the whole galaxy has a spiral galaxy, so it turns. So that means that if you have a, <coughs> an isotropic distribution of dark matter particles, which is roughly what you have according to these uh, cosmological simulations, maybe it's slightly triaxial and so on, but in, in principle, since you have a velocity with respect to the, uh, to the center of gravity of the dark matter, you see that <coughs> in Dune, for instance, you have a little bit of headwind with the, with the, this weak interacting mass of particles. And in December you have sort of a tailwind. And the interaction rate depends very sensitively on the relative velocity. Uh, so that means that in June you would have a higher scattering rate than in December. And this is exactly what this DAMA experiment in Grass has found. So definitely there is an oscillation here, and it even fits in phase with this, you know, its highest rate in, in uh, June and, and in December and so on. So this really would make one say that, okay, so we have detected the top right? so great. The problem is that it has not been verified by any other experiments. So, and there were some weaker indications from other experiments that showed some oscillation, but not as big as this one. And all of these are in tension with the latest results from C900 Lux and Super CDMS. So we will, uh, well, we will see that later. But this doesn't really seem to be a reproducible experiment, unfortunately. We have had this situation as well, as you see here, you know, it's 5,000 days, so it's, you know, 15 years or so. And actually, we have had the Dharma uh, result unexplained since 1997. But now, finally, it, something seems to happen, that there is a new experiment with superior sensitivity being planned. It's uh, Frank Calafras and colleagues at Princeton. It's called SABER. And this is just without going into any details. So here one sees the, the problem that Dama has, that one has this phenomenon background at very low recoil energies. And uh, one suspicion is that this could perhaps be uh, depending on season, because this is uh, caused mainly by neutrons. So one has sort of an internal background in the, in the crystals from, from neutrons that is very uh, painful to them. And with this new experiment, uh, first, even if, well, if one has uh, no veto, one gets this distribution, gets rid of all of this uh, background. And if one has with veto, <laughs> meaning that one has this detector inside a, a, a neutron detector, then one can get down almost to, to zero background. So this would be extremely interesting, but as usual, it would take time. You know, they have just started, they have made the crystals and they see that they work and so on. But it will take a few years before they can really challenge uh, Dharma. And maybe they find that Dharma is right, and that's it, right? Because that's what we demand in science. That each 
results. In particular, these uh, very spectacular results have to be reproducible, have to be to be able to reproduce by independent experiments. Yeah, here is the situation presently for this <coughs> direct detection that we've seen on Android, uh, which has a, a rather big, important contribution now from, um, from Heidelberg, so this is uh, Manfred Linder and his colleagues. Also at the Oscar Klein Center, we have gotten involved now in this Xenon experiment. So Jan Conrad with us has uh, just obtained a big grant from the Wallenberg Foundation, as it's called. So we will <coughs> join Manfred and his colleagues, and I think it will be very interesting to follow. Uh, actually, they have competition from the US. This is a large experiment that are presently in the lead. Uh, but this data here is for Xenon 100, and now Xenon 1 ton is actually being built in the Grand Sasso Tunnel. So that this will be a very interesting race between these collaborations, actually. So, and hopefully the sensitivity will go down even further and they may eventually find the signal. So this is the, the remarkable progress that I made. So in you know, 1985, I remember when the first data came on the course. You know, there was some very optimistic predictions from, from theories also that maybe one could have found it already here. But then, uh, you see they have improved by one, two, three, four, well, five orders of magnitude since 1985, and the future expectations are equally high. Actually, one could get the results all the way to the neutrinos that come from the, the sun, so the coherent neutrino scattering. That would be a very, very difficult uh, background to, 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 to break. But fortunately, they have, they have a few you know, decades to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see if they find something. Indirect detection. Well, here's the basic picture. You have these two particles that meet each other, and this is just one example for a supersymmetric particle. They interchange some, maybe a heavy particle, in this case a spermion, a squark, for instance, and it gives a fermion, antiform, fermion, and final state. And of course, if these are quarks, then what happens is that they fragment into what's called jets with ordinary particles. So it's basically lots of ions, but it could also be you know, protons, muons, and electrons. And of course you would get antiprotons and, uh, yeah, and electrons and so on. So you, could get, you should get equal amounts of particles and antiparticles. And as we said, that's a very interesting thing because there's not too much antimatter in normal cosmic rays. So that's an obvious way to search for uh, the results of annihilations like this. So if there is an excess risk of positrons, that would really be a, a sign that something is, is creating uh, positrons in our galactic halo. Uh, gamma rays are very important. One could, in, in some cases, actually get a two-body final state with two photons going back to back. And since this annihilate essentially at rest, because I was saying, you know, they move at 200 kilometers per second, very fast, one thing, but that's only V over C, 10 to the C. So they're very, very far from relativistic. They're extremely non-relativistic. So essentially, these are very massive particles that annihilate at rest. And if you have two photons going back to back, each photon will get exactly the rest mass of the annihilated particle. So it's an extremely good signature. So if you have a spectrum of photos and you get a peak at just the energy that corresponds to the mass, that would really be a smoking gun of our uh, So this is a comparison now of these methods, the direct and indirect detection methods. Uh, so this was something we did a few years ago with Dr. Brickman and Joachim Mitchell in Stockholm. And uh, as you see, uh, it, it's a little bit you know, depressing in a sense, because we had this neutrino here scattering unit, and we found, so this is a huge scan of uh, supersymmetric ball, 
models. And remember, these are good templates for Wix. So this is generally true for other Wix also. That you can always find uh, models that are below this between our limit. So, so a, a point here, for instance, would be essentially impossible to detect with direct detection. Of course, indirect detection might be a possibility, but also there, you know, it, it's almost science fiction. So that, I think one has to, you know, that, that's somewhat sobering. That some things I would say may, may use, make you think that, oh, the discovery is imminent. But it could have this bad luck, and this is in a region where it cannot be really, uh, detected by So that's unfortunately something much would be high and it's high and I'm not high yet. So this after we did this there were <coughs> even bigger scans of parameter space for supersymmetric models and this throws essentially the same thing. You know that this the coherent between our uh, limit is here and there's lots of models down here that are not uh, visible. So uh, we have seen that both direct detection, where we have the Dharma indication that they have seen something that has not been verified, so it's not a scientific uh, finding yet. Also, for indirect detection, <laughs> there have been claims of uh, detection, and I will not read through this, I will just show some examples we have gone through. But actually, I want to point out that there is one specific advantage of gamma rays that they are not affected at all. You know, the higher the gamma rays in the GEV region or higher is not absorbed essentially at all in, in the galaxy, not even if you point towards the galactic center. So that's also a, a very good signature that once you get both the spatial uh, distribution and energy distribution consistent with a, a dark matter model. And actually, when we started to look at this, so this was long ago, this was in the end of the 90s, we showed, for instance, that uh, in the NFW model, as it is called, that it, it seemed that you could get a signal, signal from the galactic center from continuous gamma rays. So this was shown for 50 GeV uh, particles annihilated into GeV bars, so it's you know, a pair of quarks, and the continuum signals this one. One should also get a gamma ray line, but this is the intrinsic uh, height of the line, and unfortunately with present uh, day detectors this would be smeared out, so it would barely be visible actually. So here one needs uh, much better energy resolution detectors. But anyway, we noted this, and uh, a few years uh, later, some other people like William Burr noted that there is this uh, excess uh, towards the galactic center of gamma rays called the GEV excess. So we could just add a, a 70 GEV um, supersymmetric particle and I annihilate into the bar. So essentially what we had done, but this, uh, so here for the uh, 70 GEV, we had 50 GEV. And we show that you know you can fit something in that, but also one could fit uh, other cosmological background processes to give essentially the same quality of fit. So we actually had noted that already. We made the following statement that already 1998. In fact, present eager observation that was the gamma ray mission that was active in those days are not inconsistent with the continuum spectrum originated from dark matter analysis, but other kinds are possible as well. So this is exactly what we see here. And it turns out that some of this eager TV excess may even be uh, due to imperfections of the, of the instrument. So now there's a little bit of deja vu, I would say, for, for me, because uh, Dan Cooper and his colleagues have made a case for a very long time, this is a very recent paper with the data and King Biner and others, that indeed they could fit a dark matter particle annihilating. So this is the, their uh, distribution for so something, you know, 50 dB or, or 40 dB, something like that. But again, it's like we said already in day that, you know, well, now we're not looking at dB at all. 
so now let me say here that in fact present Fermat's method are not inconsistent with the dark matter argument, but other uh, processes are possible as well. So and actually soon we might get more uh, information on this because there's an experiment called AMS that hasn't presented yet their anti-protocol data. And if this is really given by dark matter going to DBR as claimed by these people, there should be an anti-proton signal that the AMS experiment really should detect. So that would be very interesting. Uh, so we thought that they would present uh, results later this year, but we hear now that it's probably early 2015. It's rather imminent. Uh, in the meantime, uh, these people have analyzed the data very carefully and they have shown that indeed one can explain this with dark matter, but one could also fit a broken power law. And here it, it's, it looks like this uh, sort of broken power law it fits much better, but that's because these errors are correlated, so one is a little bit fooled by that. And actually, the dark matter, uh, so, so this is actually dark matter to be regarded, and that fits equally well as this broken power, uh, as you can see for the, the chi square. But uh, maybe this is a sign that it's not really dark matter, it could be more extended towards higher energies. And there is something actually <coughs> that's called the millisecond pulses that seem to fit equally well as the, the dark matter. And we are involved now in the Australian Center with a very interesting proposal that has just been submitted. So it's a joint ESA and Chinese Academy of Science in joint mission. Uh, it's called Tango, and it's, it's a rather small instrument, and that will complement the Fermi in that it has extremely good angular resolution. But it, it's not a big experiment, so this will really concentrate on the GV rate. And one could uh, resolve more of the galactic center, very complicated uh, processes that happen there, and in particular the millisecond pulses, one could get uh, more of them and see how it extra extrapolates to, to, uh, to really smaller uh, regions around the galactic center. So that, we think, is a very interesting process. So this is just to show that Fermi, at the present time, at low end, it's like under MD, has an angular resolution of 5 degrees. With angle, we would get, you know, 1 degree. That, that makes a lot of difference for many of these processes. Uh, actually, here's something that also is a little bit of a problem for this uh, interpretation of the EV excess at the galactic center. This is dwarf galaxies. Because the galactic center, okay, the, uh, the, the dark matter density should be highest there, but there's a lot of other things going on there in the galactic center. There is this huge black hole that you've probably heard about, and there are all of these millisecond pulsars and whatever. So it might be much uh, more efficient to look actually at these dwarf galaxies, because they're, they're extremely clean from other processes. Actually, one hasn't detected really gamma rays from, from many of these. So at least one could, if, as long as one doesn't find anything, one can put uh, stringent limits on the contribution uh, from dark matter annihilation in these dwarf galaxies. And this is very recent data that were presented just a few weeks ago in Nagoya, Japan. And here it seems, so the claim of Dayan et al. was that, you know, 40 GV would be the, uh, the uh, preferred mass of, of, of their effect. And here we see that it, it, it's really a feeling tension from the uh, from new Fermi data. So this was the old limit and now the new limit has gone all the way here. So within a few years they should sort of cover all of this. Now I should uh, really mention that this has been contested a little bit, so I think so let's try about that. I have to assume So no sense will happen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So Abazayan has updated this, and it's not trivial to go from the complicated structure at the galaxy center and these sort of simpler uh, dwarf galaxies. So there is 
the, the, the problem of how you do the, uh, the interpolation of the angle density, for instance. And then it seems that maybe half of the dark matter will start excluding that. Half of the positive uh, possible. But anyway, this is a, a, an interesting complementary way to study the dark matter, the possible dark matter activities in the, uh, near the, the galaxy. Okay, so this is now uh, about this line, as I mentioned, that uh, there were great hopes in, in 2004, but actually we thought that the Velasta, as it was called then, then it was renamed into Fermi when it was launched, and that was, as usual, a bit later than predicted, <laughs> so it went up in Christmas name, and it has been working extremely well, actually. But this plot turned out to be very optimistic, and of course, this uh, very strong peak was not found. But there was found you know, a couple of years ago actually indications of, of a peak, a little bit like that. So this is from uh, this Venegas paper from 2012. And he showed that the data that I had there could really uh, be consistent with something that, you know, it's a, a smeared line, it's smeared with the energy resolution of the instrument. And the significance is quite high, it's 4.6 sigma, or 3.3 if the so-called low gas square effect is included. But particle physicists know what it is. And, uh, but unfortunately, as Fermi took more data, they couldn't really reproduce it this, uh, themselves. So it seems they had some strange instrumental effect that, that you can see in other directions of the sky. Uh, that gave an effect exactly at this 130 uh, dB. And also it seemed to be a, a statistical fluke, so the significance has gone down as more data has been collected. So at, at the moment it's you know, maybe one point as high, but this is too narrow really to be a real effect. Of course, this is just you know, the one instrument that has some problem with, with uh, the, uh, this energy range. Uh, but fortunately there is presently uh, a campaign with the HES2 telescopes, the large telescope. Actually we are involved also there in the Oscar Klein Center. And next summer we hope that we will either find this with you know five sigma in that case or we could exclude it with really high significance. So of course this is science so we should really test with an independent experiment is a, a, a line feature or not. So we should get a definite answer on that. And it seems that there is a future for this line circuit because there are experiments both in Russia and in China in Kansas that have really superior energy resolution, angular resolution and even size. So for instance, the ultimate instrument could be what's called HER, the high energy radiation detector on the Chinese space station. Not many people know that, but they are actually putting together already now their own space station. Because, well, because it's too, to, you know, big world politics. They were excluded to be members of the so called international space station. <laughs> so now they build their own. And of course, now they have the money and the resources, so this detector would be really something. And the plans are that it should be very long from our equipment. So, not too many years from now. And there are actually, there's a precursor. This is called the Dark Matter Particle Explorer that will be launched next year. And it seems that they are actually following this very aggressive schedule. And all of these have detection of dark matter as in the science drivers. So, if there are lines, it might make all kinds of <coughs> investigations that you know, learn about. So, this is something one had the gamma gamma line and the Z gamma line, for instance. So this is how it looks like. Uh, also, there is in, in Europe, and that's something that's uh, uh, very topical here in Heidelberg, because it's the, the big CTA array of uh, carrying telescopes. And here's one analysis by Matt Wood <coughs> that shows that in the region of 100 GV, which is here, and, and 1 TV, which is here, one can really get way below this uh, wind miracle line, which is here. Right? So, and this
these, and these are some uh, models that are tested. So that's uh, really a, a, a niche that the CK can have in the dark matter search around this very high energy. And of course, if nothing is found at LAC, the CFA really has the possibility to detect even TEV particles that would never be seen at the LAC at the current energies. So let's see how all this time, yeah, <coughs> maybe a little bit on antimatter. So this, is, this was a very surprising discovery of the Pamela experiment a few years ago. But these were the prediction, and these are in the, the measurements. So it's always uh, there is a, an extra source of positrons. So maybe this could be due to, to dark matter. Well, first of all, one has to check is this measurement correct? And there was this AMS experiment that presented the data just a year ago. And indeed, they find this striking rise, as you see here. Uh, but again, it's a little bit like the DV says that this can be fitted with dark matter to be sure. But one needs a very large so called boost factor. So, some uh, theories we know about the solar effect enhancement, so that has to be a play a role here, and, and really uh, to, to an extremely large extent, so maybe a thousand, a thousand or so boost. Or it could be fitted by something more mundane, like P plus M squared from supernova elements. And I would, of course, I think at the moment, put my money on. Supernova. Uh, but one doesn't really know that. Right? But that is uh, the problem with these sort of featureless distributions that it's almost always possible to fit either with dark matter or something else that's sort of more normal astrophysics. But of course, the uh, MS experiments, uh, experimentalists themselves, hope that this could be you know, a sign of dark matter that it falls off and this should be the mass of the dark matter. But it's not difficult to actually fit a uh, uh, supernova remnant uh, model to that also. I will not give the alternatives. So, what we did was instead to <coughs> notice that, so if we go back, we noticed that this curve is extremely smooth. So, there are no bumps really in this curve. So, we can use that instead to put limits on dark matter going into anti electrons. Uh, so that's what we did here, and we put the rather strange, these are really the most stringent units on that type of models. So it's more stringent than W map and, uh, and Fermi and so on. So, so sometimes even negative results can, can be used in a sort of positive way to show us that a dark matter going, for instance, to E plus and minus directly is not uh, viable below or under the this is the ice cube that also is, uh, has a large involvement from uh, the Oscar Klein Center in Stockholm. Uh, so there are limits, they haven't really found anything, but uh, that is also interesting. <laughs> and this is something that, well, when I first sees this one thinks, okay, one has to have imagination here, because it's claimed that this is, you know, a three or four sigma effect of something that's denoted in red here, otherwise we wouldn't see it, right? So this is a KEV or 3.5 KEV line that could in principle be another kind of dark, and now we leave the wind scenario. So in principle one could have a, let's say, a sterile neutrino, and maybe that sterile neutrino is not stable, maybe it decays, you know, with a lifetime of, you know, order of the age of the so, if one has a 7 kV neutrino decaying into a photon and maybe some other neutrino, then one would get again a line because something decaying at rest to a photon and something else is most massless. So, a line. So, that has been the claim you know, of, of these people. And I will not really go through all of these you know, arguments for or against. I will just show the recent analysis that came just a week ago. Uh, where Stefano Profumo and his wife actually, Tesla uh, and Eric Carlson, <coughs> show that uh, from dark matter decay you would have expected a distribution like 
the red line here, or that, that you saw here perhaps, in the asymmetrical distribution of the events on the IP center. But of course, the actual distribution follows the molecular and atomic uh, lines. So it's definitely not a uh, talk about it, you see. Uh, and I think this, this is the, the key argument. But we'll see. I mean, this is science. You could, probably there will be more responses on the archive. So you can read this for fun. But to my view, in my view, this is the uh, science. It's not talk I don't think I will have time to go through Galaxy clusters, which is a pity because one of my course here, Christopher Crawford, is in the real history. But of course, this is how dark matter was originally found in the Roma cluster. Uh, so, this is just work that we did with uh, Anders Pinsky also. And, and, and the only important thing is here is that there should be substructures that contribute. So, really, like Dwarf galaxies, but even smaller structures, and the smaller they are, the less they shine. So some of these are completely dark, but of course for annihilation they could be important. And that's what we show here. That you know, for the, just the NFW profile on this and like this, but then we have to add this, and it depends on the system. And we show that really for galaxy clusters, one, one could get huge effects from from this. So this is the, the substructure. And that was actually, in some sense, verified with Oxford in a way, in this big simulation by Walter Spring and Simon White and his people, where they show that this is what I get from the NW profile. <coughs> but, so this is a radius here, but due to the substructure, one would, would get a more extended profile of the emission. Now it turns out that this is not sort of waterproof. We just used an extrapolation of, of simulations that are not really perfect. So there have been a real analysis and these people, Santos Conde, who is actually uh, presently a postdoc in Stockholm, by the way, and Prada, <coughs> they get um, quite different results. So they get, you know, as you see here, uh, maybe a factor of 100 or so uh, less than what we used. So if this analysis is correct, then it might be difficult to see a top band signal from the but again, this is not yet settled, so clearly more high resolution analysis are hard needed. And this is uh, again very new results from the firm using this lower boost factor. And then one sees one doesn't really get down to this magic line here, which is the wind miracle line. Uh, but one should also say that it seems that the normal gamma ray emission from clusters seem to be much lower than expected. So, and that's good news because then they are really like the dwarf galaxies, you know, something that doesn't have a background where you can actually search for dark matter. So, maybe, the, you know, and of course the boost factor might be somewhat bigger than you see here. So, it might be that the fertility event from clusters by Fermi, or in the TV region and by CK, maybe from dark matter. So, that's, I think, a very exciting prospect. So, I hope you so dark matter has been or detected in many experiments with varying mass and signal strength, but no detection has yet been confirmed by an independent machine. So in that sense, it's not science. And I think this is a very good example of how the science scientific method has to be used. You know, you, you may claim that you discovered something, but we will not believe you until somebody else has you know, done a similar experiment on the same thing. Uh, and several claims seem to be due to systematics and or poor modeling of the backgrounds. And the many flaws around in this field, I would say, is probably caused by visual thinking in experiments that have the potential sensitivity to, to actually detect dark matter for favorable values of parameters. And of course, you know, if you then see some strange thing in your data, you psychologically, it's, it's very easy to jump to the conclusion, oh, this must be dark matter. Uh, so I think we can also learn a lot about scientific sociology from this data. <laughs> and I think we just have to keep calm and skeptical also in the future as the effect is growing more powerful. But eventually a confirmed signal should be found, that's my conviction. And several extremely interesting projects have been planned with data taking this five to ten years. So at least, you know, it's going to be the coming decade will be extremely interesting. But of course I have to add, answer the question in 
surprise. Nobody has repeated a Dharma-like experiment up to now. Number one. The second is all other experiments are by far not sensitive enough to have enough statistics to look for these seasonal oscillations. So that they don't see anything is not surprising. Yeah, I have two comments that there are actually some experiments, like the, the, the Kim's experiment in Korea, that I have also in so the mind like. But, so they exclude parts of the region that Dharma is consistent with. But uh, in principle, I think you are right, that one cannot really exclude that Dharma is right. And that's why it's so nice that Frank Price and his colleagues are now setting up a new Dharma-like experiment with this superior uh, discrimination against neutrons 
that you know within a few years we, we will know. And maybe Dana is right, but so far it would have been nice if at least one of the other experiments would have seen it, you know, being consistent. But within the present, you know, 90 percent confidence, they seem to be, you know, not not favored. Let's put it like, like that. So that's. Uh, but I, I agree that this is something that has been with us for a long time, and nobody has found a flaw really in their analysis, yeah. as far as one has seen. Yeah. Further questions? Not a question, but I yeah. yeah. uh, You said you will not give up mm -hmm. as long as you're fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and eventually you will find it. A, a funny warning in the case of stellar paradoxes. Uh -huh. They succeeded after many false alarms, but it took 250 years. Yeah. From 1576 to 1838. Yeah, yeah. No, no, sure. <laughs> but still, you know, this is, uh, yeah, now we really did it uh, philosophy. But I think, you know, humankind will solve this problem. <laughs> let's put it like that. And let's hope that uh, no major conflicts will destroy that hope. <clears throat> I have a question. There were several graphs where you actually showed model predictions compared to sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how, how I should actually interpret the density of points of the model predictions. Yeah, that's, that, that's uh, a good question. I don't think you should put any uh, weight at all to, to the density of points because it really has to do with how the scanning is done. And uh, there are, you, to say something, you have to use what's called the Bayesian analysis. You have to put some priors. And I personally think that's very dangerous because it will make you think that the density of points means something. But it really means what your, what your prejudices were that you put in this prior. So uh, it's just a. Uh, an, an example of the size of, of the parameters, okay. which is huge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, all experiments about dark matter, uh, you can be summarized by the statement that matter interacts by limitation and happiness. Yes. Yeah, What's so wrong with that? No, I mean, yeah, and as I've shown, even in, even in supersymmetric models, that may be the case. That, but. It's not exactly the case because there you have all of these points that I showed, they have the correct relic density. So that's your handle, right? If you have a particle, so how was it produced in the early universe? And we know that from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, for instance, that you know this relativistic uh, thermal uh, treatment works very well. So that, that's the thing, if you have something that's only created gravitationally, you can show that you cannot really get the required density uh, just through gravity. Then you really have to modify gravity somehow, you know, in a completely different sector or something. But well, that is only, a, I think, a convincing argument if you will uh, manage to connect dark matter to the standard model. If dark matter is something completely different, uh, then nobody knows. Yeah, no, no, I, I, no, sure. I mean, that's, uh, but I, I don't see that really as a scientific question in the sense that also if you have something that is weak interacting, it could be that it is in the corner of parameter space, you will, you will never get there. See, so it is the same thing. I don't think anybody knows what happens to gravitation in the Big Bang. You see, it's, that's why gravitation could only be yeah, well, well, we'll see. You know, and, and that's, so, so actually, one hand that we could have, at least for processes extremely near the Big Bang, is if we wait for the results from, you know, this Planck bicep combination and see if, you know, if there is a polarization there. So, so we have indirectly handled some even the earliest time, but not at the moment. But, but no, I think it's a good point. That, you know, could, could be something completely different. But uh, this wind miracle, I think, is you know, it's one of the few handles that we have. So we should 
try that road before the <laughs> And, and uh, as I said, some people here are so young and ingenious, they will not give up. They will solve this, you know, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so with that, I would like to uh, close the session. Let's thank uh, Dr. Yeah.